All right, amen. First Samuel chapter number 17. So a long chapter, uh, definitely, but we will get through it because the goal is to do one chapter a week, right? I mean, there, you can come back to this chapter for a whole year as a church seriously preach a sermon every week about it. I mean, there's just so much in here. Um, so just real quickly, uh, real quickly, last week we talked about um, the countenance of a shepherd. And that's kind of what uh, highlighted chapter 16, if you will. If you remember, uh, the, the countenance of David was vastly different than that of Saul when Saul, uh, Saul was crowned king. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about 16 here in a while. But uh, what, one thing that I, I do want you to remember is that David was hired by Saul last week. Okay, Got re- to remember that because it's important to understand these so-called controversies that are at the end of this chapter here. But let's get to it here. So the beginning of the chapter just kind of sets the stage geographically for what's going on. Okay, You've got uh, the children of Israel on one side of a mountain. You've got the Philistines on the other side of a mountain, and their champion's going to come out. And so basically the idea here is that they would come down to him into the battle, or into the valley, rather, to fight. So we look at verse 1. It says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shucho, in, or which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shucho, Ezekah, and Ephesdemim. Verse 2, it says, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And you have to remember they've been under Philistine oppression for a while. They're breaking free from that. Um, the last few chapters have kind of showed us victory. you know. But the Philistines are having a hard time letting go their control over Israel. And they have a secret weapon. And his name is Goliath. And he's a, uh, a very large person here. And Israel is va- uh, afraid of him. Look at verse 3. It says, And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them and it's kind of you know I, you think about this and you read this why is this in the bible here and i think oftentimes it's because you know before you ever go to battle typically most times you can actually see the trouble before it starts you know and so the idea here what this pictures is us on one side of the mountain the world on the other and you know sometimes the world's baiting us you know hey come down here you know you fight my fight you play my game right and we have to be very careful when they do stuff like that to us because it can pull us out of our element and then now we're fighting on their terms and their turf where they're comfortable i remember i met this kid when i was uh probably about seventh or eighth grade and he was a really good street fighter right this applies right <laughs> and, and i asked him i was like i was like I was like, how did you get good at street fighting? Because he was just beating, beating people up all over town. Not a troublemaker. He just, you just, it is what it is. And he said, you know, this lady taught me this truth, and I've never forgotten it. And I was like, what is it? And he's like, you never fight somebody when they want to fight you. And I was like, okay, well, what does that mean? And he, and he explained this to me, and he's like, well, okay. He's like, I get these kids riled up, or we argue or whatever, and they always say, well, meet me at the park. Right? Or we're going to fight uh, in, the, in the break room. We're going to fight over here. And he says, and I agree to that. Because in their mind, he says, what they're doing is they're rehearsing the fight in their mind. They're comfortable in that location. He's like, so what I do, say, yeah, I agree to that. And bam, then I just hit them like right there. And they're not, they're not, <laughs> you know, they're not expecting it. You know, they're thinking we're going to fight at the field after school. And he's like, and they just start fighting right there. And it just blows. He's like, and I win every time. And he's like, I'm not very strong. I, I don't even know what I'm doing half the time. He's like, but it works. I was like, see, so you just sucker punch people. <laughs> He's like, well, yeah, yeah, more or less, you know, and that's, but that's what the world does, you know, and that's kind of what I think of when I read this here. You know, some things like that, you just stick with you. So look at verse number four. It says, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And there's all kinds of crap and garbage out there about Goliath, right? I've heard people and I've read articles where people said, oh, you know, he was like 25 feet tall and he was actually a hybrid. And it's like, shut up. That's not what that's talking about at all. Verse 5, it says, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. I read an article that said uh, by some rabbi that said that his armament or his his armor, if you will, was 60 tons. No joke. That's what you get from, uh, you know, from the, from these rabbi types, these scholarly types. That's the wisdom that they will give you, which is not wisdom at all. And so basically what, what the Bible's doing here is just kind of setting the magnitude of the situation, right? Because obviously we're going to see God deliver Israel through David. And so the Bible's just kind of setting the stage here and letting you know, you know, here's what the terrain is. Here's the conditions, you know, and the task at hand is, is a battle and, and all Israel's afraid. 
And so, you know, the Bible is just showing us the magnitude of their problem right now. If you look at verse 7, it says, And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. So he had somebody that would go before him in front of him with a shield, and he would help block and, you know, do certain things while Goliath would basically swing his weapon and do what he had to do. Um, if you look at verse 8, it says, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And so perhaps Goliath was a slow runner because he's not exactly going up. I mean, if he's such a great warrior, why didn't you just run up the hill and just start, you know, smiting all these guys? And it's because that's probably not in his physical nature. You know, a lot of people that are very tall or very big, they have a hard time running. Right. I mean, you know, there's not just think about this. There's really not that many gymnasts that are over six feet tall, you know, that are super athletic like that. And so if I had to guess, he probably wasn't a fast runner. And he also a worldly guy probably wants the, the preeminence and he wants to put on a show. He wants to be able to kill somebody so that all of his men, you know, up on the hill can watch and cheer him on. You know, it's kind of like a, a modern day or a, an old time you know, boxing match or like a, like a UFC here, right? You got, instead of TV, you got this show going on right here. You know, he's got center stage. He's, he's down there like, hey, come, come fight me. You know, send somebody to fight me. And again, this is the world saying, hey, you play my game, right? That's what the world does. They don't want to come onto our terms, right? They don't want to spend time studying the Bible and learning these truths so that they can fight us. So what they do is they grab scripture and they twist it and they try to bait you into an argument based off of that twisting and they're always trying to gain you you know they're always trying to basically gain your senses right and take control of your mind you know and lead you on little rabbit trails with the whole goal of just making us look stupid yeah. that's what he's doing here but you know he, he's obviously using weapons and wanting to fight verse number nine it says if he be able to fight with me and to kill me then will we be your servants but if i prevail against him and kill him then shall ye be our servants and serve us you know, I, uh, when I was in grade school, I had to do this biography on Muhammad Ali, and I remember this, reading this, and um, he said that when he was growing up and he was training in boxing, that somebody took issue with him and didn't like him and wanted to fight him on the street. You know, well, you prove, it proved to me how tough you are, you know, Mr. Boxer. And so what he did is he said, you know what, I'll fight you, but you have to fight in the ring. You know, that way we got people watching, and he basically just sold it to him. And he said in this biography, he said, I, I didn't know what would happen on the street. He's like, because I'm comfortable in the ring. I'm comfortable with my coach in the corner. I'm comfortable in that environment. But on the street, you know, he was just like, you know, anything could happen and I could lose my footing and there's nobody there to help me. So I knew, this is what he's saying, I knew that if I could just get him into the ring, I could just mop him up. And that's what, exactly what happened. And so, you know, it, it just goes to show, don't let people rope you into their games. Right. You know, who's ever heard of that Ben Shapiro guy, right? That Jew, you know, he's a conservative Jew, right? But he's a Christ hating uh, individual, some, you know, some so-called smart guy. Now, a lot of the, the, the arguments that he makes are valid. You know, he makes good points and he's able to roast people all because he kind of uses tactics like this. You know, he knows how to take people and bring them to where he is comfortable. And we've talked about this uh, before in other sermons. So just something to be aware of, right? That's what the world does. They want to fight you, but only on their terms where they're comfortable. Verse number 10, it says, And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we can fight together. And so now what you're going to see is that this statement here from Goliath, this challenge, if you will, it causes fear to run rampant throughout Israel. So if you look at verse 11, it says, When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 12, it says, Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And this is, this is important here because you're going to see that Jesse plays a vital role into solving the equation at the end of the chapter here. Verse 13, it says, And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the next unto him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. 
And in verse 15, it says, But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now, you got to stop right here and ask yourself, where is David currently? What is his job? Well, go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 real quick. And we, we need to take a look at this here. 1 Samuel chapter number 16. And what you're going to see here is that Saul has given David leave because remember he got hired by Saul because God sent an evil spirit to trouble Saul uh, in chapter 16. So look at verse number 18 here. So you remember the story from last week, right? God sends the evil spirit. He doesn't, Saul doesn't recognize this. His servants are like, okay, you've got an evil, an evil spirit from the Lord troubling you. We need to do something about this. And then it says in verse 18, then answered one of the servants and said, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite that is cunning in playing and a mighty valiant man. And then this next phrase we talked about last week, it says, and a man of war and prudent matters and a comely person and the Lord is with him, right? So remember what we talked about last week. People say, well, this is a problem here. This is a controversy because David at this point in his life was not a man of war. You know, there's no record of him fighting in Israel's army or in any army for that matter. Now, what you have to realize is it says that this servant is saying this, right? God's word is true. So it's true that this guy said that. But what you need to realize is that the, the, the phrase there, a man of war, is an expression. It's a figure of speech. The Bible says that the, the, the Lord is a man of war. Okay, so it's, that's all he's saying. And, and plus, you got to remember, his servants are probably not having the best time in life, having their boss troubled by an evil spirit. So they're probably just like, hey, you know, we know that Saul likes to go and snatch up people for his army, which is what winds up happening. Hey, he's a man of war. Maybe they heard his feats with the bear and the lion that we read about later in the chapter here, right? Maybe you heard about that. I mean, that's kind of war as well. And so there's no problem with this here. There's no contradiction here. But look at verse 19, wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. Verse 21, and David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. Well, that sounds to me a lot like a position in the army. So David has now been hired to not only play for Saul, but to be his armor bearer. Verse 22, and Saul sent Jesse saying, I'm sorry, and Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. Now go back to 1 Samuel chapter number 17. And again, look at verse number 15. It says, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. So at this point in David's uh, early career <laughs> with, with Saul's army, he's been given an opportunity to go back home and visit his family and feed the sheep. Verse 16, it says, and the Philistine drew near uh, morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And Jesse told, or said unto David his son, take now for thy brethren an ephah, of this parched corn and these 10 loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren. Okay. And so it's important to realize Saul knows who David is. He just hired him in chapter 16. He knows who David is. It, it, just keep that in the back of your mind. And we're going to keep reading here. Look at verse 18. It says, and carry these 10 cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. And so Jesse's saying, hey, go give this to Abner. Go give the stuff to the leadership here, you know, and kind of comfort these guys and take their pledge. Find out their welfare. How are things going? You know, because he probably realizes, you know what? Fear is a snare. And so they're kind of wondering, well, how's this going to play out? You know, are we going to go back into Philistine bondage? I mean, the nation knows that Saul is just messed up. You know, word has gotten out and they're concerned about him. Verse 19, it says, Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. It's kind of a picture there of Christ leaving us, but you know, or, or leaving earth, but sending the Holy Ghost to take care and to comfort and to teach and to guide. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Look at verse 21. It says, for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. So now there's fighting and stuff going on. Verse 22, and David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brother. 
And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And so remember, this is ongoing here, right? Goliath is coming up for 40 days. He's just every day like, hey, you got anybody that wants to fight? Huh? Do you got anybody who's man enough to square off with me? You know, you guys want to sign off on this great deal, right? Whoever wins basically becomes the, uh, the, the oppressor. Verse 24, it says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Now, why is it? Why is it that this army at this point in time is so scared and they're so afraid? And by and large, it's because of the sins of Saul. That's really why. You know, when you have a leader and he's fearful and he's scared, you know what? A lot of times the followers will be the same way. And that's basically what you have here. Look at verse 25. It says, And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man whom the <laughs> and the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And you're going to see later on that that's used to basically ensnare David. But verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I like David's attitude here. He has the right attitude, which is he is a man after God's own heart. He's already filled with the Spirit, but he's not afraid. He's like, wait. All we got to do is just take this guy out. Yeah. You know, he calls him an uncircumcised Philistine, basically saying, hey, why are we afraid of this heathen? Yeah. But if you look at the verse there, it says, and the men of Israel said, or, I'm sorry, it says, and David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach? So who is by and large causing the reproach to Israel? It's one man. It's this one guy. And, you know, a lot of times the world, you know, they have trends and cycles and stuff that they go through. But, the, you know, they often will have like one big thing that they come at us with. Right. And what, what is it right now? Well, it's the sodomites. Right. And they use that as a Goliath and they, they try to challenge people. And you see Christians failing and running scared all over town all the time. Yeah. Right. Afraid to talk about it. Afraid to address the issue. Afraid to say anything because they don't want to offend the world. Right. But it's very easy to defeat just by simply reading and believing the Bible. Amen. You know, it's not a problem at all, but they're afraid of that one big thing that they have. And when you really get down to the bottom of the matter, it's nothing in the sight of God at all. We, God always has our back. And we always say this because it's in the Bible and it's true. Fear is a snare unto man. So that's why you see a lot of these pedophiles, you know, creeping into churches and completely changing everything. I mean, how in the world, like, I wish we could just go back to like 1950 with a picture of that church up on Five Mile of Victory with the Black Lives Matter and the fag flag and all of that crap and just say, hey, here's what the Methodists are like in 2020 in conservative Idaho. Yeah. You know, that's what they do. They don't just come in and molest. They molest the mind, the soul. They take everything. Right. They're, they're like a satanic vacuum is what they do. They just come in and suck everything out of a church, out of an organization. And, of course, that's why God blew them out. Now, look at verse number 27. It says, And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Now, verse 28, it says, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David and said, Why camest thou down hither, and with whom? Hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Now, Eliab is obviously here. He's out of touch with, with what's going on. Because, I mean, think about it. David is Saul's armor bearer now. He's in the army. And, you know, you may say, well, that's not the most great position. No, but it's a starting point. He's in the army. He works for Saul. Saul's already sent to Jesse and, you know, said, hey, you know, I'd like to take David. And he's like, yeah, take him. You know, take this, this cheese and all this other stuff, too, while you're at it. You know, he's got no, no issue with that. So, Eliab, you know, he's wrong here to have this attitude. It's like, well, okay, why, where's your toughness? Where's your attitude? Yeah. How come there aren't more people like this saying, hey, we can beat you. We can get out of this situation. But, you know, anytime that you get an idea, you know, I'm going to do great things for God. I've got this idea. You can almost guarantee that somebody is going to come at you and say, oh, really? 
with that, with such little experience, you know, with your few little sheep, you're going to get out and do something for God. You know, you've only read the Bible like maybe one time. What are you going to do? How are you going to go to somebody's door and knock on there and tell them how to be saved? You know, whatever it is, this is what people filled with envy will do. They will try to belittle your plans and you just can't let them do it. You got to be like David and just be like, hey, verse 29, David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Right. Who would you like to be like here? You want to be like Eliab and go around and try to squash people's dreams, people's ideas, people's plans that they have to serve God and to do great things? Oh, you can't do that. You can't go soul winning in a time like this. There's a pandemic going on. You guys need to go home. You shouldn't be out here. Well, that's kind of funny because I just saw Pizza Hut leave your door and you didn't chase them out of here, did you? I just saw Amazon leave and you sure as heck didn't chase them out now, did you? But all of a sudden, Shield of Faith Baptist Church comes to your door and wants to give you some spiritual truth, and now it's a big deal. Now it's an issue. You see what I'm talking about here? Those are the Eliabs of the world. Those are the people that, you know, oh, well, I go to church, and we would never do something like this. Yeah, we know, which is why we don't go to your church. And we, that's why we're not friends, by the way. So look at verse 30. It says, And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. So Saul's at this point is like, well, let's see what he's got to say here. In verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Verse 33, and Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Again, it's kind of along the same lines of Eliab's attitude here, right? You decide, you know what? Hey, I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to get involved in this fight. You can bet somebody's going to come at you and say, you know what? You're just, you're just not meant for that. You're just not a warrior. You can't do that. You shouldn't listen to that kind of negative talk here because David doesn't. So it says, uh, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And so basically what Saul's saying here is, hey, you know, he's been fighting and, you know, been a soldier for a very long time. That, that's, that's basically what's going on here. And people will take this verse here, right? And they'll say, see, he's a youth here. How is he in the army? And there's a contradiction. So we just need to change everything. No, it doesn't say he's a child. It says he's a youth, okay? So obviously he's probably under 20 years old because that's the age in the Bible where you're considered a man, okay? But that doesn't mean that he can't fight. Obviously he's filled with the spirit. He's more than capable. He believes he can do it. Let him try. What's the harm? No one else in Israel's, you know, stepping up. And you don't think there weren't tough, physically tough people back then? I'm sure, of course there were. There had to be. But it does, you look, you have all the muscles and all this stuff that you want. But if you're fearful, all that is for not. It's for nothing. You could toss all of that stuff right out the window. And David's like, hey, I know I'm ready. I know I'm a stripling, right? I know this, but I have the Lord and we can do this here. So look at verse 34. So now what you're going to see is David begins to give his resume. He's like, hey, here's why I believe that I can do these things. Verse 34, David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. You know, at this point, <laughs> Saul's probably just like, well, if you did that, go ahead. You know, <laughs> let's give it a shot here. Verse 36, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Now, this is very important here. I believe it's critical that you, that we keep track of the victories that we've had in our lives. Because that's how you build upon things. That's how you increase your gains for anything that you do, is you remember the, the, the times that God has delivered you. You remember the prayers that he's answered for you. You remember those victories, those wins that you get every single day. It's critical for your success as a Christian in anything that you do, Amen. right? And David is doing exactly that. I mean, these are great feats here, right? He, he's like, hey, look, I've already handled adversity in my life. I know that I can do something even greater than that, which is to kill this experienced warrior who is bigger than everyone here. So look at verse number 36. 
I'm sorry, verse 37. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And so what does David do? He gives credit to God. Right? He's not like, look at me and what I did, man. I'm the one that did this. Right? He gives credit to God. And he's like, I know that if God delivered me out of that situation, that he'll deliver us out of the Philistines' control here. Verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. And you can see that a lot, a coat of mail. It's just, a, it's basically his body armor, right? We don't know exactly what it looks like. You know, you can go online and read about it. Oh, well, there, there was like chains. And, you know, some people say, well, it was chains. Other people say, no, the people who say it was just like a coat of chains, they're stupid. It was actually metal plates. Who cares? It's armor. Okay, that, that's basically what's going on here. Don't miss the principle for these little minute things. We weren't alive back then. We don't know exactly what it looked like. The point you're going to see here is in verse 39. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. You know what? And that is some wisdom right there. Yeah. David's like, hey, I don't want to risk going into battle, not having proved these things, not having tested this armor. Out. He's like, I might get exhausted. It might get in the way. It might not feel right. It might distract me and I might not be able to get the job done. And he knows that. And so he's going to do what's comfortable, right? It's kind of like the old boxer versus the wrestler. You know, when the boxer decides he wants to, to play wrestler because he's had a few lessons, he always gets mopped up. Yeah. That's what happens when you play the world's game. David knows that, and he's not going to fall for that. Look at verse 40. It says, And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in, his, or in a shepherd's bag, which he had even a script, and a sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. No fear. Right? He's like, look, I've got this down here. We're going to win. I'm going to take it to the Philistine, verse 42. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. So he's like, who's this preppy kid coming here to fight with me? This has got to be a joke. <laughs> you know, this, can't be, this can't be real. And it actually angers him. Verse 43, and the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Now think about that. This Philistine here obviously believes in his gods, which would probably include Dagon, even though he went belly up a few chapters ago. But, you know, the Philistines, they just don't want to get rid of Dagon. Uh, verse 44, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And look, don't, is it? I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. The world says the same stuff to us today. You know, it seems like now it's like not a week goes by where somebody doesn't say something similar to me in an email or a text message and, you know, bleep you and your charity. It's just, it's just like a constant, you know, and we can't be distracted by these types of things because that's what breeds fear. That's what slows the church down and limits the growth and the gains and everything that we work for and that we want to achieve. And so we just have to realize that and push forward and not be afraid of these things. So it says in verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And look at his confidence going into this. You know, just unshakable, unmovable here. That's the attitude that we all need to develop and need to have. You know, and, and, and a big part of that is because you know, he just held on to the victories that God gave him in the past. And was like, look, if God saved me back then, why wouldn't he do it again? See, this is the point that the children of Israel missed early on, right? I mean, think about it. Like I talked about this morning, they saw the Red Sea split. I mean, they saw more than that too, right? They saw all the, the just the, the hell that God brought on Egypt. And it's like, look, there's, there should be no doubt that God's doing all of that, but yet they just forgot about it, and you brought us out here to, to starve us to death, and they're just murmuring and complaining. You don't see any of that from David. He's like, no, I know what God has done for me in the past. I'm going to remember that, and I'm going to use that experience to have him save us now in this situation. Verse 46, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. 
that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. And so again, this is kind of a slap in the face to the dispensationalist. Well, back then, only the Jews could be saved, even though if you were to call them Jews at this time period, they'd be like, what's a Jew? You talking about Judah? What, what's going on here, right? But what is David's end goal here? He wants all the earth to know that there's a God in heaven, meaning he understands that everybody can be saved if they place their faith and trust on God. He says in verse 47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And that's something as well that we need to make sure that we remain steadfast on, is realizing that our battles belong to the Lord. You know, when we go out there and we go soul winning, or, you know, uh, even we go to some of these tougher neighborhoods, you know, we just need to realize the battle's the Lord's. You know, and that's why we always pray, hey, you know, Lord, please help us to not miss an opportunity to see somebody saved out here if they're out here, if they, if they want to learn the truth. Because we realize, look, it's not us, right? We're just the vehicle. God is the one that's going to lead the battle and give us these victories. In verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. I get a lot of the, the, the veggie tales, I'm guessing. And, uh, you know, the Sunday school lessons, they leave that part out. Right. Okay. They, 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 that, well, that's just pretty, but we don't want to, we don't want to pollute the, the minds of the, kill, the children. Well, guess what? These things were written for our admonition. Okay, we, we, need, we do need to shelter these kids from the filthiness of the world, okay? But that doesn't mean we need to shelter them from the harsh realities of battle, especially when God's involved. God, there's, there's, there's lessons here. There are things that God wants us to understand and to realize by reading these. I mean, this is what a man after God's own heart did, right? And guess what's coming next? Verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling. And with a stone, and smote the Philistine, and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. This definitely misses the Sunday school lesson here. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And you know what? That's what happens to these sodomites. Like usually when I respond, like, you know, just shut up, you fag, you know, just, just get the hell out of here. They're just like, yeah. what? <laughs> Thou art not going to worship me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a minority. You know, I, I, I'm, so, I'm a big deal here. And yeah. we're like, shut up, queer. They're just like, <gasps> you, what? Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> you going to die? I don't think so. It's just words. You know what I mean? It's stupid. But that's all it is. You know, and, and, and here's the truth. When these other Christians hear stuff like that, they're like, yeah, all right. And then they're just like, <laughs> right. Hey, that was great, man. Hey, that was great. Yeah. That, was, that was cool. All right. Oh. It is what it is. But this is what he did here. And guess what? We don't read the following verses saying, and God came down chasing David, and he's a psychopath. No. Look, he's making an example of this dude. He did what he said he was going to do. And that's what mighty people do. They say they're going to do something and they do it. Right? Didn't he not tell the Philistine, hey, I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to feed you to the carcass, or to, to the birds, rather. And that's what he does here. Verse 52. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pers uh, pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shereem even unto Gath and unto Ekron, verse 53, and children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. So it's kind of similar to the events that we read about with Jonathan and his armor bearer, how they said, hey, the Lord doesn't save by, by many or few. Let's just go up and see what happens. And that kind of sparked a little, you know, fire in, in, the, in the army of the, the children of Israel and they were able to go forth and conquer, you know, but this is on a larger magnitude, a larger scale. So what God's doing here is he's signifying to Saul that you're your reign is done. Here is the new king. And Saul's starting to get the hint here, and you're going to see that. Verse 54, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Now, when we get to 2 Samuel, we'll have to come back here because there's a little controversy over the sword, and it's, it's nothing. It's easy to deal with. All, all these problems are problems that people have made. 
okay? And you're going to see that here. Verse 55. So what we're going to do is we're going to read from verse 55 to verse 58. We'll talk about it, and then we're going to go to Genesis 49. So verse 55. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, uh, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. Verse 56, And the king said, Inquire thou whose son this stripling is. Now, the word stripling just means narrow or, or thin, kind of like a chicken strip. Right? So he's just a young youth, right? And he's like, Who's this stripling? You know, which is why he's like, Why do you, just being kind of a thinner, young youth, want to fight this, like, nine-foot-tall guy? <laughs> you know, but whatever, go for it. Verse 57, and as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. Okay, go to Genesis chapter number 49 real quick, and we'll just deal with this. I don't know how many of you have heard this before. I've heard it several times, uh, just, 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 just in my life. You know, people say, well, this is a contradiction in the Bible. This is why we need the scholars. This is why we need to dig up the new man. You know, you know how the story goes. Talk about it all the time. But I will show you why. So what they'll say is they'll say, okay, actually, I remember the last time, well, the second to last time I heard this. So we're going to this church. It's called Calvary Church. And after the, the Wednesday service, we used to take down all the chairs and roll up all the audio cords. And I was rolling them up. And prior to that, this just this random thing happened to me. Like I was, I was downtown, I was getting off the ferry, coming home from work. And I, I had my Bible and I was putting it in my bag because I was reading it. And this lady looks at me and I think she was one of those apostolic types. She said, that's not a King James, you're going to hell. I said, shut up. And I, I was just in a bad mood. I just walked. Okay. I'm like, I'm not in the mood for this. You know, I, it was King James. Of course, it's me. You know, even though I was going to liberal churches, I always had the King James, you know. And so I was telling that story to this guy who I went to high school with. We went to church together and we're rolling up these cords. And he goes, you know what? That story really bothers me. He goes, I can't believe people put their trust in some stupid old book like that. I said, whoa. I said, did you just say that about the King James Bible? And I, I was speechless. I'm like, you're like second in charge in this church. And that's when things started to change for us as a family. I was like, I cannot believe what I just heard. I'm like, is that your opinion of the Bible? And he's like, well, nobody reads that old book anyways. I was like, what the hell kind of church is this? What am I doing here? And he goes, you know what? He goes, the King James says that Saul didn't even know that he had amnesia. That he didn't even know who David was. He's like, I can't remember where it is, but I, this, this is where it was, okay? And basically, what, this, the, what, what he was implying and what the, the atheists and, and the, the omos, the original manuscript audience will say, they'll come to verse 55. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it for you. It says this, And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As this soul liveth, I cannot tell. Okay, so what you have to understand here is who is Saul inquiring about in that verse? It's David's father, okay? But people read that really quickly, or, you know, and they realize that most Christians don't read the Bible, and they'll say, no, why is he inquiring about David here? Didn't we just, like, didn't, you know, didn't he say he was his armor bearer? And the answer is, yeah. He's at, what, what Saul is doing here is he's starting to realize that there's something going on here. How is this stripling, if you will, how is this young guy able to come in here and all of a sudden he's finding favor with everyone? He just basically sparked, a, you know, a revolution. He smoked the Philistines. He, he defeated Goliath, who has oppressed us for all this time. And he's starting to wonder, wait a second, whose father, who, who is his father? Now, why would he want to know who David's father was? Because he's trying to find out what tribe he's from him. Okay, that's the idea here. That's what's going on here. And verse 58 proves that because he says, I am the son of thy servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So David mentions that, well, Bethlehem, Bethlehemite, Judah, all these things play together here. Now, if you're in Genesis chapter number 49, look at verse 10. It says this, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, this had remained a mystery 
for a long time in Israel. They didn't understand what this meant. And just to give you some background here, so Jacob is about to pass away. He's about to, to go be with the Lord, and he's basically giving out the blessings to his sons. And he starts with Reuben, and you know, basically says, you know, you're, you're, you're unstable, you know, because you went up and basically you had an inappropriate relationship with my concubine. Uh, and so Reuben being the oldest or the firstborn, he lost that privilege, okay? And then what happened to Levi and uh, uh, Simon? Or, or yeah, yeah, Levi and Simon, what happened to them? Well, if you remember, they went and they basically destroyed Shechem because of what they did to the sister, and that's a, a, just a whole other issue. So next in line is Judah. And so that's why this verse is in the Bible here. But it says, The scepter, so the power shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. And obviously this is a reference to Jesus Christ coming, and we could deal with that. But I believe that they knew this. They knew that somehow the tribe of Judah was one day going to have the scepter or the, 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 the throne. Where, where's Saul from? He's from the tribe of Benjamin. And so he already knows because Samuel told him, hey, you're done as being king, right? And so he's seeing this here and he's like, wait a second. Whose father is this? Because he wants to know if he's from Judah. That's what it is. There's no controversy here, okay? He's just simply saying, whose son is this youth? He's not saying, who is this youth? I mean, he just had a conversation with him a few verses before. <laughs> But I'm serious. You have people, and there's a lot of them out there that believe this stuff. It's like, look, you know what I told that guy while we were rolling up cords? And he was like, I can't believe people believe in that old book. I was like, you know, the NIV says somewhere in 2 Samuel that Elhanan killed Goliath. So you might as well just rip 1 Samuel entirely out of your Bible. Because that's what it says. And he's like, well, that, you know, you got to go back to the Greek or go back to the Hebrew. And he started, started with all that junk. But look, these people are out there. They believe that this is a controversy, that this needs to be corrected, or, or like somehow this proves that Christianity is just a hoax and this is, this is a, 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 just a done deal here. It's, it's ridiculous here. He's simply asking, Saul is simply trying to find out who David is because he knows he's on his way out. And then once he realizes that he's of the tribe of Judah, then guess what? That's when things, and you're going to see next week, they just start to go extremely downhill. And now he's like, okay, well, I'm not even going to let you go back home anymore. Right? And then what happens? David increases in favor with God, you know, and with the people. He starts, you know, doing, having more victories and more wins, and he's putting all these things together. And then what happens? Saul gets filled with envy and tries to kill him because he knows that God's hand is upon David and that David, being from the tribe of Judah, is going to take that scepter. You know, and he is going to be king over Israel. And it's just going to continue down that line all the way until the very end. So go back to uh, 1 Samuel here. <laughs> Verse 57 again, it says, And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And like Saul's just like, I don't care about that. I just want to know who your dad is. <laughs> who are you? What tribe are you from? Because remember, you know, the, the Saul's servants, they just said, hey, we just need to find somebody to play music for you, to comfort you. And we, we know this guy, you know, this, this is the son of Jesse, right? They couldn't even name him. So how much did they really know about him, right? right? That should tell you something there. You know, so, so Saul just in haste was like, yeah, let's, let's bring him over here. He auditions great. You know, he gets the job, done deal. But he doesn't even really know David that well. And so now he's like, wait a second here. Is this how God's actually going to remove me? So don't, don't read that and be like, oh, you know, that's a problem. It's not a problem for anybody in this church. Okay. It's because Saul's realizing that the end is near for him. Yeah. And he's like, wait a second. I believe they knew that. They look, they knew that verse. Yeah. It's, I mean, look, they've had Samuel and Samuel loved God. Samuel knew the law. Samuel knew these things. Heck, Samuel was in Shiloh. <laughs> You know, I mean, come on, let's, let's give me a break here. In, even though that's a reference to Christ, don't tell me they didn't know because they did. And Saul's smart somewhat, like, like knowledge, like book smart. Like he knows, like, wait a second, my days are numbered. God's going to remove me. And he's probably been just kind of wondering, like, how? You know, and sometimes that's how it goes. You know, God says that something's going to happen, but it doesn't always happen immediately. Right? And so time goes on, we get complacent, or we just start to, like, wonder, like, did he really mean what he said? Or like, how's this all going to play out, right? Like with the end times, you know, like how's this one world government exactly going to be like if like America seems like it's crumbling right now, you know what I mean? 
but you'll, what you'll see is it all comes together in the end. God's going to put it all together. It, it is, it's almost never like we imagined. You know, like if you could fast forward to the to the Antichrist ruling and, you know, reigning temporarily on this earth and just look at the condition of the people and the technology, you would probably be shocked. Like, I'm not saying it isn't soon because it sure seems like it is. But what if it isn't? Yeah. yeah. You know, what if it's, it goes on? And so basically that's the position that Saul's in right now. He knows his time's out. He knows he has to leave, but he's just like, how is God going to remove me? You know, is he, am I just going to die and then I'm going to get replaced or what? And he's like, wait a second. No. Because why else would he want to know who his father was if he wasn't concerned about that verse right there? So no controversy, no nothing, no problem at all. And it's like that with all of them. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, uh, for this, this, this great chapter of victory and, the, and the, just the infinite wisdom that we could pull from this lord and just pray that uh, you bless the fellowship after the service and be with us as we travel this week in jesus name i pray amen